Okay, it's nine o'clock, so we might as well get started. Uh, this is presentation, Converting a State Machine to a C++20 Coroutine. I'm Steve Downey. Uh, I'm an engineer at mm -hmm. Bloomberg. Uh, I work in our, uh, it's called our communication channels group, where I work on what are essentially our instant messaging and our uh, email product that are facing our customers. I'm currently working as in the software reliability engineer, system reliability engineering group. Um, I've worked on the back end of both of the systems, uh, as well as uh, through various other parts of uh, Bloomberg over the course of my uh, now 18 year career there. Um, so let me get started. Okay, so just in a quick abstract, uh, C++ 20 crow routines can naturally express in linear code components that are today a written as state machines that wait on async operations. Uh, I'm gonna walk through the low level machinery and customization points uh, to convert a state machine which waits at the end of steps for async service operations to complete into a single coroutine that co-awaits these operations. So we've got to go through a super brief and inaccurate summary of C++ 20 coroutines. Uh, inaccurate only in the sense that I am going to skim over some details, uh, not intending to actually tell you anything incorrect, uh, but there are a lot of details uh, in coroutines. So whatever you think they are, it's probably less than that. Uh, the coroutine machinery is not actually terribly deep, but it is broad. Coroutines are kind of like lambdas, actually, except the uh, lambda is the return type. Uh, coroutines, they control when they suspend. And there are no stacks, threads, or fibers, or anything like that in uh, uh, C++ 20 coroutines. Uh, on the stackful versus stackless uh, divide, C++ 20 coroutines are stackless, uh, which means they execute on the regular stack of whatever calls them or resumes them. Uh, the architectural model is very different for things like than for things like fibers um, or for or lightweight threads or anything like that. Um, if you don't know what any of those terms are, especially stackful versus stackless, just forget they exist. Uh, basically, coroutines is just is a resumable stateful function. Now, what is a coroutine? Co awaits, it's a coroutine. So anything that has co await keyword or co yield, which is a co await. Um, with some special machinery around it, uh, and, or it co-returns, which is a very special co-await uh, with some notes that we'll get to a little bit later. Um, when we do, uh, write a co-routine, uh, it gets, the compiler transforms it. Uh, Basically, the transform looks something like this. Um, we take the coroutine, we take the function body of uh, uh, the existing, of the, uh, whatever you, this is whatever you've written as the body of your coroutine. And first, the compiler is going to figure out what the promise type is and construct one of them. Um, it's going to then uh, do the initial suspend, uh, whatever the promise type says it should do, uh, wraps this all up in a catch block, uh, checks to see if uh, we've initially awaited anything. Uh, if haven't uh, actually gotten started at all, 
It just throws again. Otherwise, it'll call promise unhandled exception. Um, and then it hits the final suspend point where it will do whatever the promise says to do for a final suspend. And by the way, these promise types have nothing to do with stud promise or stud future. Uh, it's just a term being used. And to be a little more clear, uh, promise type is determined by the coroutine traits class, uh, but it's usually a type def in the return type um, that's looked pulled out by the coroutine traits. Uh, the constructor arguments, uh, the parameters that are supplied uh, to, the, uh, to the function, if that's a valid overload, uh, otherwise it's empty. Uh, the function body is just the body of the, the coroutine that you wrote. Uh, basically all this machinery gets wrapped around your code. Uh, the initial await resume called, uh, basically, was the initial well, suspend called or not? Did we start? And final suspend, uh, uh, this is the footnote that went with co-return. It's the target for co-return, which calls either return value or return void, um, which we'll get to a little bit, a little bit more in a moment uh, first. And then it does a go-to final suspend. So it's just... Uh, providing a spot for that. Um, that go to target, that label is for exposition only. You can't actually reach it in your code. Well, let's talk about a waitable and promise. Uh, we've talked a little bit about promise. A waitable is um, the other side. A waitable are the things that you co-await. And waitables are relatively easy. There's basically three uh, methods that an awaitable needs to provide. Uh, await ready, uh, whether to proceed or suspend the coroutine that is co-awaiting the awaitable. Uh, false means to, if it returns false, it suspends and the coroutine is suspended and waiting for it to resume. Uh, await suspend, uh, which there are th three forms of basically a return returns void um, or it returns bool or it returns a hand coroutine handle to something. If it uses the void form, uh, we just call await suspend and suspend it. Uh, if it returns bool, we call await suspend and resume if it returns false. Um, and if it returns a coroutine handle, which is uh, what it says, a handle to a coroutine, this might be a co some other coroutine. If it returns that handle, we call resume on that coroutine handle. So we can chain, do things, with, interesting things with chaining of coroutines. I uh, won't really be discussing that, uh, but it allows for sort of interesting use cases. Um, and then await resume um, returns whatever the value of the co-await expression is. Um, we call that when we resume. And um, then T is the result of that, that uh, co-await. Um, we expect the awaitable interface to be programmer facing. Uh, people will write and should be writing awaitables, uh, which are the things that you co-await. Uh, what they will probably not be doing as much of is writing the promise type, which is the um, connected to the return type of a coroutine, which is how you interact with the coroutine from outside. So here's a minimal example of an awaitable. Uh, it uh, inherits from suspend always. Uh, it's a, um, suspend always is a standard library awaitable. It implements all three of these uh, methods. Um, 
its implementation of await ready is to just always return false. Uh, it um, oh, suspend always uh, has empty bodies for await suspend and await resume. Uh, basically doesn't do anything. Uh, here in this example, uh, we're going to await suspend. Given the coroutine handle for our for the coroutine that is awaiting us, and we just say go ahead and resume that, um, and await resume is just going to return a default constructed T for whatever our uh, little awaitable is here. Um, oops, sorry. Promises are a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's a, um, generally, you'll have some uh, return type for the coroutine, which will have a type def of promise type. Um, there are other ways of looking up the promise uh, via coroutine traits. Um, they're essentially for if you do not have control of the return type of the coroutine or are trying to model something. I mean, something else that you don't have good control over and you could not change or extend. Um, the promises, uh, oops, okay, ignore that no term. Um, sorry, the get return object is the return type of the coroutine. Uh, basically it's like, this is what um, we go from the, the promise to uh, for example, the generator or task that uh, the coroutine is uh, controlled via. Then we have either return value or return void. Uh, if we return void, it just returns. Um, if we return value, this is the value that the coroutine is returning. Uh, yeah. The initial suspend method and the final suspend method are called before and after the body of the coroutine and unhandled exception, how to handle an exception that wasn't handled by the body of the coroutine. Um, promises and coro return types are really library writer facing for the most part. Um, we're Generally hopeful that for C23, we can get some uh, standard coroutine types uh, into the standard library, things like uh, generator and possibly task. Um, but of course, because the standard library is, is essentially, once it's in, it's in forever and you're stuck with it, we are in not in a terrible rush to get them wrong. Um, we want to, want to make sure that whatever we put in works for everyone, doesn't have any weird corner cases or such. Uh, on the other hand, if you write your own, you own, can write them um, to satisfy whatever your particular needs are. Uh, these aren't, they're complicated, they're not magical. Now, uh, GCC's implementation of coroutines is almost exactly Lambda. Uh, when the coroutines entered, uh, it instantiates an, uh, an unnameable type uh, that's tied to the particular coroutine frame. Uh, that type has a bit of state which indicates where to jump uh, when a, re-enter the coroutine uh, and it ties it to the return type via the promise. And basically every time that the, um, we re-enter that via the handle, it's handled, it's, that type's given a pointer to its frame and um, it um, restarts or uh, picks up where it, where it left saw. So if we have a minimal boring coroutine, um, we have a 
minimal uh, co-row that is going to be the return type. We have the promise type uh, inside it. In this case, we're not type defing it. It's just there. So it's there by name and be looked up. Um, that promise tied to the get return by via get return object that'll produce a minimal coro. Uh, we're initializing it. Uh, this is a C20 initializer syntax. We're taking uh, initializing the coroutine handle for this promise type H uh, with a function from promise on this object. How they all get tied together. Um, basically, this part is compiler magic and basically says um, something along the lines of uh, the frame is eight bytes after this object or something like that. Uh, for this return, to, uh, for this promise, we're going the initial suspend and final suspend are all always suspend always, um, and unhandled exception does nothing. We have two external functions before and after, um, and then so our minimal boring coroutine uh, func uh, calls will, when called, is going to suspend. Um, then when it's resumed, before would be called, then it'll suspend again uh, because we're co-awaiting suspend always. Uh, and then after it's resumed again, it will call after. And then it will suspend at the very end. Um, and after that will finally get cleaned up and destroy, be destroyed. Um, Got a, uh, you can actually see some actual working code here. Where this is that coroutine in type I was talking about, the C4 func v actor that's handed the frame. Um, it's like when that's entered, uh, it's like there's this call end up. Um, this isn't, this isn't called until we've actually started resuming. Uh, we call before, uh, it jumps out, um, cleans up, calls after. It's like basically, the, the AX has loaded some state. Um, the, the code's a little more complicated, but not terribly complicated. And here is the actual implementation of the of func itself, it allocates one of these, these things. Um, and that's what essentially what it uh, returns and eventually destroys its frame. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, a little bit of theory. A few ML state diagrams, and they describe a, a, a going to be, uh, sorry. Talk a little bit about theory about what state machines are, uh, basically, um, and how they're described. The other half of the talk, um, UM, UML, the Unified Modeling Language, has a nice formal model and nice diagrams for, or, uh, for state machines. Uh, you're, it's going to describe a finite automaton. Uh, they, they were standardized as part of the unified modeling language back in the last century. Uh, now, here's a very, very simple 
uh, state machine. We're our, um, the beginning end states correspond with object construction and destruction. They begin and end. Uh, the model is that uh, we start at the uh, first black ball, we automatically transition to the first real state. Uh, here, once it's activated, we wait for packets to be received, which transitions back to the activated state. When it hits, gets the deactivate symbol, it transitions to the deactivated state. And from there, then transitions to the end state where we've destroyed whatever this state machine is. Oops. When we have uh, we can model substates with submachines. Uh, you know, the initial state transitions to off. We get the turn on off signal, and it transition. This little state machine transitions to its blinking state, which has two substates: blink on and blink off. Uh, when we first enter the blinking state, we transition immediately to the blink on substate. Uh, and on enter for that state, we turn the LED on. When we exit that state, we turn LED off. Um, there are conditions here for which uh, the transitions are described as automatically happening. Uh, so like after one and a half seconds, it transitions to blink off by itself. And from the blink off state, after 0.75 seconds, it transitions <laughs> to the Link on state. Um, we can have orthogonal regions in a UML state machine. Uh, so if we were modeling a keyboard, uh, we might have orthogonal states for numlock and caps lock. Um, this is one of the advantages over uh, traditional state machine charts, um, being able to have these orthogonal regions. Uh, traditionally, you would need to have, have separate states uh, for all the different combinations of the, uh, the keyboard could be in. So you would need to have states for num lock off, off and caps lock off and num lock off and caps lock on num lock on, caps lock off, num lock on, caps lock on. Um, and this makes traditional state machines um, explode quickly in states. Uh, and the diagrams for them become unwieldy quickly. Now, um, by having them in orthogonal regions, we can have the, the uh, whenever the number key is um, basically num lock is toggled, we transition between states, which leaves the caps lock state alone. Caps lock toggles between off and on. Um, and otherwise, any other key uh, just transitions uh, back to the state you're in. Uh, UML, the, uh, the UML group uh, based this on Harrell state charts uh, invented by David Harrell. Um, they're generalization of state machine diagrams. They're uh, intended to be much more usable for human beings. Uh, as we outlined here, you can group states together with the same parameters. Uh, making a um, substate chart uh, allows for history, returning to a state it, uh, with the substate active when the superstate left. Um, and uh, there's a book 
and a full formal model. Uh, so state, these can be analyzed, verified, uh, uh, check that they a, uh, behave in the ways that you would hope that things behave. Um, now, if you model your system as, as a state machine, which can be a very powerful model uh, in your head, it's not necessarily how you code it. Uh, there are a lot of system, uh, tools that will generate code from your state, uh, state diagrams. The code often tends to be um, not code that can be maintained by a human being. Uh, You've seen, for example, the uh, code that uh, gets generated um, by, say, uh, Yak or Bison uh, or Lex, uh, which are essentially state machines. Uh, code surrounding the bits of code that you write is terrible. Um, well, it's not terrible. It works. It's provable provable that it works, um, but it's nothing that you want to interact with. Um, on the other hand, very often um, having the diagrams and modeling your head, um, you can handwrite code that works essentially the same way. Um, and instead of generating code, the state chart is used as documentation to communicate the model uh, that is in play. Now, the core coroutine transformation is to a state machine, I alluded to that before. Basically, um, there's an object to which uh, when you resume the state machine, uh, it checks where it is, in its, um, in its logic, jumps to that and continues on where it left off. Uh, basically, there's a handle to the frame. The frame holds the stack variables, or at least the stack variables that uh, span a, uh, a suspension point, co-await. Um, the difficult there are various compiler difficulties in figuring out exactly which ones these are until fairly late into code gen. Uh, so this is usually done on the back end. It's one of the considerable challenges uh, in implementing code routines. Um, the code routine has an indicator of uh, where to resume, the bit of state. Uh, that tells it where it left off, as well as all the uh, live variables on the in the frame. Um, and it is an instance for the particular execution. Uh, if you call a co if you call a coroutine function twice, you get two different coroutine instances out of it. They don't overlap. Uh, Most of the state is maintained in the coroutine frame. Uh, it's essentially equivalent to the member variables of an object. Uh, co co-await points are also states. These are the states uh, saying where we are um, in our execution path in the flow. And the coroutine's waiting for input, or at least it's waiting to be resumed. Resumptions are essentially the transitions firing. They're the arrows on the state machine diagram. Uh, when the transition fires, the coroutine can decide how to proceed to the next state. And just we, as we saw before, state machines, most of the time in, uh, in classes, state machines are uh, introduced at the same time as regular expressions, because regular expressions are wonderfully implemented as state machines, uh, but 
Skate machines are so much more than regex. Um, now, you know, as regex uh, produce very large state machines and you definitely need the regex tools to be able to write most complex regex. You wouldn't want to write those matchers by hand, uh, but most state machines are actually fairly small. Uh, there aren't that many states in the cash register or calculator or vending machine. Uh, and doing the state machine model, writing it down helps clarify that you're not missing any transitions, or at least it allows you to consider, uh, it's like, what happens if we're here and we get this input? Um, often the answer is, no, we don't do anything, um, and that's fine. But having the context to ask those questions can be very helpful. Most state machines are fairly simple. There's going to be a, like a golden path, an error path, and a failure path. Things go well. Um, this is the, the, the good cases that programmers are very, very uh, capable of writing. Um, the error path, uh, things go badly, but in expected ways. You know, file not found or bad input. Um, it's straightforward to model that as, as a state uh, that is like file not found and now you're waiting for or, uh, someone to find the file for you or you transition to exit because there's no way to, to recover from that. Uh, the real failure path um, is things going badly in unexpected ways. You discover that two plus two equals five. Um, you're in a state, you have no idea what's going on. Um, state charts uh, have a mechanism then to basically throw the throw an exception. Uh, we can get you out to some outer or system um, and then possibly um, retry or pick up where you left off at, um, after discovering that you're in a completely unknown state. Um, uh, now, uh, there's a rule of five to nine. This shows up in a lot of places. Basically, uh, also known as the rule, rule of seven plus or minus two. Basically, we can hold about seven plus or minus two things in our heads at a time. Uh, before that, after that, if it gets larger, it's too complicated uh, to think about for most people most of the time. In order to have a, a model in your head with more things in them, somehow you have to chunk them together so that it's like if you really need to work with 15 things, if you can group several of them together and, and think of them as one, that abstraction uh, then lets you get the entire model into your head. Um, so if you've got, five to nine states or fewer, uh, but, um, and it's five to nine because it is a fuzzy edge. Uh, we can maintain that by hand. Uh, it, it's easy to think about uh, the number of states is, is small. Um, we can think about how these things interact. Uh, even if all the states were completely connected Five states gives you basically a pentagram that you're, um, which isn't a terrible mess on the page, even nine states. Beyond that, you start to get way too many lines on the page if they're all connected um, and you just have a mess that you can't actually reason about. And certainly hundreds or thousands of states, um, not something that uh, we can hold in our head without somehow abstracting 
some of that state into something that we can think about. Now, the generality of a state machine, uh, when we're modeling it as a uh, as code, uh, that might mean go to. Uh, it might, if states can reach from any other state, code might need to go to forward or backward. This is not an unstructured go to, though. Uh, we're not escaping scopes. Generally, we don't have to. Um, they're contained um, and they're controlled. Uh, these aren't actually uh, the go-tos that Dijkstra was concerned about um, when he wrote his paper. Um, they're manageable. Um, you don't need to leave the scope of the machine or the coroutine. Suspension and decision, uh, guarded transitions, which haven't, um, in, in the diagram, uh, you can, the labels next to the uh, transitions are guards. These are the conditions under which that transition is taken. Um, basically, they're, um, when we're modeling for a coroutine or a state machine, they're just uh, if tests or, um, or other control flow mechanisms after the suspension point. So you get often the model is you get something that wakes up the coroutine uh, or wakes up your state machine and it then looks at the input and decides from that event where to do, transition next. Now, as I mentioned before, we don't have standard library solutions for coroutine types. Um, we got the core mechanisms in. We have the library extension points, uh, the bits that the compiler interacts with in order to um, either co-await an awaitable uh, or to suspend or resume a coroutine. Um, as I outlined before, there are a number of these extension points. Uh, but as you work with them, they're not as many or as freely composing as, uh, as you think just looking at the list of them. Uh, so they group together. There are three for the awaitable small manageable number, uh, essentially five um, with a couple of choices for the promise type. Um, promise is based on the return type of the coroutine. Uh, they're not terrible once you gain familiarity with them. Um, they're very analogous to the special member functions, uh, constructors, destructors, uh, conversion operators that uh, the compiler interacts with regular C++ classes. Uh, they're, they're describing to the compiler how to interact with your type, uh, the coroutine expense extension points are explaining to the compiler how to interact with your awaitable or your coroutine. We really do have a plan to have some for C++23, active work in this area. Now, handcrafting the types, however, is not wrong. Uh, not everything has to be a standard uh, type. Uh, with the STL itself, the initial proposal, uh, Stepanov expected programmers to create containers and iterators for their own purposes um, all the time, uh, even ones that did not support the entire interface but were simply sufficient for the code at hand. Uh, it does turn out, of course, that 
uh, stud vector is the best type and that's the one that you want to use all the time. Um, that all is also largely an artifact of the evolution of uh, the machines that we have. Um, the advantages of locality of reference for vector outweigh so many other considerations um, that even though uh, your type might be naturally a list, even inserting into the middle of the vector turns out to be a better win than inserting into uh, cheaply into the middle of the, the list. Um, many talks on this subject. So similarly, um, having your own coroutine types that do uh, what you need them to do, uh, they may not be perfect, they may not be general, they may not satisfy all use cases, but it is entirely valid and reasonable to write your own that satisfy your use cases. That's a machinery, particularly for promises, complicated, they're, but they're tools, there are tools intended to be used by library writers, not just standard library writers. The other uh, thing is writing these types is going to help influence uh, standardization. We want to know what works before we standardize it. We have a lot of theory. Um, machinery is complicated, but we want to know what the use cases are that we're solving. Um, how often is uh, a task shared, for example? Do we need to have a, a task shareable by default? Um, what else are we missing? Uh, understanding what people are doing and what they want means we can standardize better things um, without necessarily standardizing all the things. More importantly, your types will continue to work. Um, these are entirely supported mechanisms. There's no, no terrible magic. Um, this isn't even the case where, um, it's like for years, there was the, the notion that stud vector is not actually implementable in C++ uh, because of object lifetime issues. No one really believed that. This was a more of a wording problem and a uh, abstract machine problem. Um, and while there are types that only the standard library can implement because they, they need compile, actual compiler magic, type traits, for example, coroutines are not that kind of thing. Um, If the standard adopts uh, some magical stud coro state machines, not break yours. And if the standard never does, it's not going to break yours either. Uh, so let's talk about some uh, some actual code. Now, this is not my actual production code, but I do have code that's very much like this. Uh, we have systems that take these uh, sorts of types and use them for async operations, particularly uh, for infrastructure where we're very concerned about throughput. Uh, we want to be able to do things with bounded resources uh, while we're waiting for other things to finish. So, um, one such operation is creating a user um, where this was uh, taking this from uh, one of our, uh, for example, the instant message messaging system where uh, might uh, create a chat room and create a user into the chat room. Uh, have some kind of, of ID for cre creating the user. We need to look up the user, so find them, so we do some database call, 
um, where uh, the database has some callback operation uh, so get the user by ID and when that user is finally looked up, it's going to call us back with a unique pointer to the user. Um, and here in the system, I'm returning an enum that says, okay, continue after uh, or this, go on to whatever the next operation is. Uh, are you the callback um, that's handling this basically then uh, takes the user that we're given, moves it into a, a, um, into a unique pointer that this class instance is holding, and then uh, resumes uh, the, uh, the state machine. We'll get to resume in just a, just a moment. Um, another operation that we end up having to do uh, uh, check with our, our compliance system. Um, a, because we're regulated, uh, we serve regulated customers. They need to check if things are okay before or doing them. So, for example, uh, it might be allowed that uh, we've got three users, uh, any two of which can be in a chat together. Uh, but the compliance officer for one of their companies says, uh, no, you can't be in a chat with two other companies at the same time. That looks collusion-ish, and we'd rather not have you do that. Um, so essentially, it's like in our systems, we have an external compliance system with rules of our own and rules that can be uh, programmed by our customers. And I just make a call and hand them a bunch of data and they come back with okay or not okay. Uh, we do the same, same sort of callback where we uh, store the results once we get our, our callback uh, and continue um, from the operation. Uh, once all this is done, we're going to broadcast the, the new user, let everyone, every other part of the system know that there, uh, this was done, and we're going to hand it off, uh, uh, broadcast that out. Um, and then we'll, uh, it's like, uh, after the transaction's over, uh, we're going to, the result will be a, um, hand it off to whoever wanted the result of this, creating the user in the room. So basically, we'll have a class uh, with operations, find user, okay to create, broadcast, end transaction, um, a bunch of callback that can manipulate state in the class um, and what to do after, each of them returns what to do after that state has been executed. Now, if this were all synchronous, it'd just be a, a, um, a sequence of calls. Um, and in fact, it's like um, parts of our system do just wait for responses. Um, problem. One of our challenges is particularly um, the compliance system um, can take uh, sometimes uh, like a second or two which is a long time to come back with a response. They're evaluating very complex rules. Um, and if we're waiting synchronously, the thread that's doing this operation is tied up. So we really do want to do, try and do these asynchronously. Um, we can't do any more by doing things asynchronously, but we can do better throughput. We can go off and do something else while we're waiting for that response. And basically, um, it's like throughout the system, uh, when we're looking at the this state object, we're just iterating on while it's not done. Um, and if not, we just schedule the next operation. Uh, 
Now, async callbacks and uh, interact with threads, of course. Um, you typically have some in a standard C-ish callback, you're gonna have some uh, signature sort of like this. Your uh, callback type is a function object, uh, callable, takes a, uh, a void pointer to a context, a void pointer to the response, and a void pointer to error. Uh, you install the callback with that handing it a function and the context that you want to be handed back to you in your callback. Uh, gives you the response as a void pointer because it doesn't, the framework doesn't know your type. Um, and uh, uh, in the alternative of giving you a response, or possibly additionally, it delivers error information. For C++, uh, generally we'll have uh, some a type erased callable like std function, um, where that type erased callable binds to this and whatever other parameters uh, that you have, and it you will just be called with whatever the response is. So basically the context is uh, uh, could be a could it be at this pointer or a coroutine frame? Yes. Uh, this pointer is often the context. You cast it back to your known type. Um, although your framework probably does this for you. Uh, Now, one problem that comes up regularly with callback interfaces and multi-threaded system, basically whose thread are you on? The frequent source of errors. Um, typically the callback that, that is made to you, to you by the framework is operating on one of the framework's threads. And there's very possibly state that the framework is holding. Um, it's in the middle of I.O. Uh, when it's handing things to you. Um, I've had systems where uh, the framework is holding locks for its own housekeeping. Um, there are limited operations that are safe to do. Um, and potentially you're holding up uh, anything else the framework could be doing. It can't go on and process any, any more I.O. Uh, until you return from your callback. So what you want to do almost always is just grab the response, put it somewhere or that you can get at it, such as the uh, a, in a member variable of your object, and then reschedule yourself on your own thread pool. Uh, so basically you hop off the whatever thread the system is giving you um, and get onto some thread that you own uh, the context that the, that thread is operating in. Um, with my SRE hat on, uh, also as like I'm mentioning thread pools, um, thread pools allow your system to bound the, um, the CPU that it uses. Um, systems that create threads uh, can get into states where they've created far more threads than anyone expected. Uh, this consumes uh, memory resources. Each thread needs a, it needs its own stack to run on. Uh, it also uh, can steal scheduling resources from anything else operating on the same system. Uh, schedulers um, tend to 
work with threads as the unit of scheduling. Um, so if someone, if you have two programs running on your system and one of them uh, has a thread pool with five threads and the other one creates a thousand threads uh, all busily doing something, the one running pre-threaded with all the threads gets most of the CPUs. Um, good for it, probably bad for everything else running on the same, in, uh, the same VM or machine. Um, managing the resources with the thread pool allows you to make sure that, well, the threads are all useful. Um, there are uh, issues with standard thread. Um, I've worked with operating systems where the, for example, the default thread size is simply unusably small uh, for uh, general operation. Um, worked with other systems where the default thread size was unusably large. Um, you want to uh, be able to control that in that. Uh, stud thread just doesn't give you those mechanisms. Um, your thread pools generally will, um, and hopefully we will uh, at some point be actually able to standardize these. So if you want to convert a callback to be an awaitable, it turns out to be fairly straightforward to do, construct an awaitable uh, that uh, suspends until a callback is received. Uh, so we have some API with a callback. Um, it, the, we're going to give that callback some string. That's the operation that we're doing. It's going to uh, call us back through a stud function with the integer result. Um, we can wrap up the uh, that as a, into API with callback awaitable, um, where we take our string parameter um, and we build a local awaiter that holds that parameter and the result. Uh, we construct the awaiter with that parameter. Uh, we're always going to suspend with the uh, await ready. Um, Await suspend gets handed the coroutine handle that is awaiting this awaitable. Uh, at this point, we make our call to the API, give it the parameter that we're holding, um, and pass it a lambda that will accept the result. That lambda has bound this, uh, so we stuff the result into our uh, local result holder. And then we resume our um, our coroutine. So it's like basically whatever was co-awaiting is now going to pick up where it left off. And when we await resume, uh, this returns the result as type ints or um, and we return the awaiter constructed around the parameter that we're given. Um, the other thing that we want, want to be able to do is reschedule on a thread pool. And you see this uh, um, fairly often, it'll look fairly magical. Uh, basically, we just provide an awaitable that resumes the handle uh, inside the thread pool. So um, most thread pools will have some sort of uh, schedule operation and we just schedule a job uh, that does a handle of resume. Uh, it's like we launch our, uh, we pick up where we left off, only we're now on a thread inside the thread pool. Talking a bunch about threads, but I do want to emphasize uh, that coroutines are not async. Not, uh, it's like there's no there's no particular magic 
Um, they're, oops, sorry, wrong window. Curve chains are fully deterministic. The transfer of control from a code routine is deterministic. We always know um, ex exactly where the, um, when we suspend, where that control is transferred to. It's either outward to the owner, um, or we can do a, a um, essentially a tail call like operation and jump to another code routine directly. Um, and resumption is direct. We don't um, go to a thread or go to a, a fiber or anything like that. Um, as we were looking through the uh, low level interface, there were no threads or anything in there. Um, the, mo the only thing that we have is the stack that we're running on. Uh, and that stack is just a normal stack. Uh, the coroutine frame is uh, going to be a free store on the heap. It's allocated, uh, but that's just like any other heap allocated object. Suspension in particular is not async. Nothing happens to a suspended coroutine. Uh, it's not going to resume itself. It's not running. It's not checking to see if the, the weight has succeeded. Um, it's not doing anything. The uh, instruction pointer has moved elsewhere or for this thread, whatever thread we're running on. Which, uh, transfer of control, again, is sync. Suspension control, uh, uh, hands off on the same thread. It goes, uh, um, the instruction pointer is moved to wherever uh, the deterministically we determined where to send it to, whoever owns the coroutine or a particular coroutine that we are uh, cooperating with to transfer to. Um, when a coroutine is resumed, it resumes on the th same thread as the resumer essentially a function call mechanism. And async is external to the coroutine. If we want async operations, we need to build that somehow. Um, it's like it, it is external to the coroutine mechanism itself though. Now, um, and we can, so we can build async with coroutines. We can run them on threads. We can schedule, the, we can hand them to a thread pool to be executed. Uh, but some mechanism needs to do that uh, rather than being, being um, handed to, uh, to you. Uh, um, this is the biggest difference between coroutines and adopted and what the stackful or uh, what we're now uh, tend to be calling the fiber model is stackful, stackful coroutines. Uh, there are multiple stacks you transfer in between them. Um, they tend to be less deterministic. Um, they look more like threads, but they're ultra lightweight. Um, and controlled entirely in the process. Um, Coroutines have none of that. Uh, in particular, however, this means that for any um, thread uh, or synchronization mechanisms for multi-threaded code, you need to be very aware of that. If you're holding a lock inside your coroutine, that coroutine is holding the lock even if it's suspended. Uh, it's a, um, suspension of a coroutine is not exit of a scope. So your, um, your mutex guard is still guarding that mutex uh, until you resume. Uh, this means that it's, um, if you're not aware of this, it's much easier to deadlock yourself 
with the coroutine. Now, as you as saw above with the converting a callback to a waitable, it's, we can uh, turn sync from async. Um, the async callback looks very synchronous, but we're um, basically able to go off and do something else while we're waiting for that, that uh, callback to be activated. Now, Using the machinery just outlined, uh, this code looks a lot like what you'd expect. It's like we've taken a logical, uh, logical state machine, we can transform it into something that's linear, essentially linear code. Uh, we co-await the get DB user, um, and the result of that co-await is the uh, unique pointer to the user that we're that we're waiting for. Um, we co-await our thread pool to reschedule our, ourselves on the thread that we own. Um, and we then co-await our compliance check. Uh, that goes off and does its thing. And once compliance is completed, uh, we get, get reactivated and get the result of that. We then switch back to our own thread. Um, we then check uh, if the result was okay. Uh, we queue the broadcast, like putting out uh, uh, this data onto like a Kafka queue or something, some such. Um, let everyone know about the user, um, and then we co-return the user and is okay pair. Um, I've wrapped this up in a task here. Uh, the task is uh, going to hold the promise type. There are a lot of task types um, out on the uh, out on the web. I won't go into this too much, but essentially, um, tasks are, are job-like things. Uh, now you can see the logic here is a lot clearer than having that class with uh, with the various states that we. Uh, figure out how the states transfer into each other. Um, but it still has the same model for what we're, uh, what we're doing. Uh, we're waiting for, for things to happen, picking up where we left off, deciding what to do, um, the flow of control, uh, are the state transitions uh, that we have. Um, and with this mechanism, writing a new async uh, state machine is considerably easier uh, than creating a whole class and doing all sorts of registration work for it. Um, and that per uh, summarizes what what we're, we've been doing here. Um, we've got time left for questions, if anyone has any. Okay, how would you do cancel or time out a coroutine being co-awaited in case a service operation is taking too long? Um, there are a couple of mechanisms for doing this. Uh, basically, uh, The general mechanism is for your for your awaitable to take something uh, to itself uh, check uh, to generate an event. Um, so it could uh, be resumed on one or the other firing. Uh, it. The machinery is a little complicated, uh, so I didn't want to uh, try and show code for that. Uh, but yeah, it's like there are there are well understood mechanisms for saying in, um, this didn't work. And essentially, that then you're um, you have some choices for how to deal with those timeouts failing. Uh, your co your waitable might throw on this exception. 
um, or it might uh, return uh, something like an expected type where you have, uh, for example, a user or error. Um, So that um, there are a few there are a few tut few tutorials out on the web for how to implement uh, this. Uh, let's see. Any opinions on TLA plus modeling from from Lamport versus Harrell? Um, I haven't done uh, significant work with TLA plus modeling. Uh, so it's a little hard for me to say. Um, back, oh, what seems a very, very long time ago, uh, in the dot-com era, I was using Harold State Charts, though, to uh, model uh, web interactions when I was working at a uh, one of the first online stock, stock advisory services. And we had to be fairly careful about modeling uh, the interactions uh, for, uh, we've given you a recommendation and it's like allocating stocks and then um, it, all of those sorts of things, uh, making sure that the transitions worked, um, having, a, having a model, a literal model helped a lot, especially uh, we had to discuss very often uh, with the actual financial professionals. And it was much easier to teach them the visual language of state charts than it was uh, looking at code or HTML or um, Java Tomcat operations or anything like that. Um, the, so they could read the, the state chart and say, wait, no, we, we need to do, make sure this has happened first before we can continue on and with that. Uh, it's like, uh, your account must be funded before they can actually execute transactions, but they can set up the transactions before the, the account is funded, for example. Um, but I don't, yeah, I've, I haven't done actual TLA plus modeling though, so. Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any other uh, outstanding questions, uh, which either means I've done a reasonably good job of explaining all this or totally confused you. Uh, hopefully this was more enlightening than confusing. Um, hopefully it's a, you're now in a better place to go out and actually uh, run write some coroutines, uh, start using them experimentally. Uh, state of compilers for these is uh, GCC has a reasonably good implementation uh, for it um, in their current release. Uh, I didn't run into any uh, internal compiler errors, uh, et cetera, with it. Uh, Microsoft has a very good implementation in theirs. Clang at this point uh, is still in uh, more experimental uh, in terms of what you can do with coroutines. Um, but it's certainly uh, for MSVC and GCC uh, in a good enough state to start um, experimenting with them um, and uh, I would have no, if I could use the latest version of GCC in production, I wouldn't have issues with actually putting coroutines in production at this point. I haven't seen any issues with that. Uh, for me right now, it's more a, cha more a challenge of getting the compiler upgraded generally, which is waiting uh, uh, for lots of uh, upstream issues. Uh, before we can get and before we can get there. Um, but. Oh, actually, okay. 
got some other questions here. Uh, how do you get a change in behavior for a method depending on internal state? Well, it's a, um, that's actually fairly straightforward. It's just a method. Um, you do that the same way you would for the state of any object. Or in a coroutine, uh, when you resume, you can look at the results of that coroutine or and do whatever logic uh, that you want. It's just code. Um, I did allude is a, um, you may need to have a go-to label if you want your um, coroutine to jump backwards, for example, to a state that you've already been to, um, or you may have cooperating coroutines that bounce back and forth between each other. Um, Um, does it require any runtime library support? Is the magic happening at compile time? Okay, the magic is happening at compile time. Um, you could, uh, if I went back to that compiler explorer, there isn't um, the extent of stand, stood library support uh, where those, um, standard default co-awaitable types, uh, suspend always and suspend never, which are just types. There's no magic there. Um, the support um, is all compiled in as just code. There are jumps that uh, move the instruction pointer around. Um, you don't have to do, unlike, for example, fiber frameworks um, where you need need library support for doing things like switching stacks. Um, it's all just compiled code and you don't need to worry uh, about having a, the correct uh, compiler support library. Let's see, how does performance scale with states versus as current approaches? Um, from what I've seen, six, six of one and half dozen of the other. Um, if you're building state machines, you're building some kind of machinery. The um, coroutines, uh, because they allocate generally, do you have more overhead than uh, a plain function call? Uh, or even a, um, a plain lambda, uh, which does mean there are issues with uh, having tens of thousands of, or millions of active coroutines, uh, since that means millions of small object uh, allocations. Um, however, uh, for the systems I'm looking at replacing uh, handwritten mechanisms with coroutines, I'm already allocating to have this state. Um, so there really is not in a particular uh, difference. Um, the generated code, uh, particularly um, at, uh, after optimization uh, is, uh, as good as what I was writing by hand. Uh, and I only expect it to, be get, to get better because uh, compiler writers are very good at being able to optimize the code that they themselves are generating. Uh, it's low hanging fruit from their point of view. Uh, so I um, expect, Machinery is good now and should continue to get better. Okay, is it possible to co-await a list of tasks? Uh, you might want to wait for all of multiple operations or just one of them. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, 
uh, if you take a look actually uh, at Lewis Baker's CPP Coro library, um, which is unfortunately a bit out of date. Uh, it was written back in the uh, um, TS era when uh, all of these things were in the, in the experimental namespace, but it gives you an idea of what is possible. Um, certainly what we, uh, there are core operations like await all or await any, uh, where you look at, um, I want all of these uh, coroutines to finish before uh, and await on all of them, or just await on the first one that finishes. Uh, perhaps it's like, um, you know, it's like there are four ways of doing something. I want to do the fastest, uh, whichever one turns out to be fastest. Uh, this is also a, a situation where cancellation may be useful where you uh, await one and cancel the others. Uh, but yes, you can, can absolutely do that. Okay, uh, another question. How does speed performance scale and compare to current approaches? Um, Okay, uh, um, from my initial testing, um, the, uh, this seems to scale as well or better than current approaches. Current, um, where current approaches um, are essentially either raw callback mechanisms um, or uh, something like what I presented here where I have a handwritten state machine activated by callback mechanisms. Um, we put together the state machines uh, to help us deal with callback help. Um, it's a, um, when you have callbacks that you're awaiting that you're also possibly giving callbacks to someone else, it gets hairy. Um, it also is not very visible to the compiler. Um, the, um, it's difficult for the compiler to optimize. Uh, because the coroutine body is uh, one function from the most of the, from the standpoint of most of the uh, code, um, get much, much better optimization opportunities across the uh, across the coroutine body. Um, essentially, we, we get a lot, just the visibility improves things. We also saw this uh, with lambdas versus uh, handwritten callables. Um, compiler knows this that something is a lambda. It knows a lot more about uh, what it is and how it's using uh, it as over um, even an uh, operator function call. Yeah. Um, as I said, uh, this is, coroutines are just out of the experimental phase. Uh, so uh, it's like, although I, don't believe that they have any um, any deep problems. Um, we don't have a lot of history of using them. So basically, I've got a, uh, got a bunch of micro benchmarks, um, got uh, comparisons with our existing system. Um, I'll be honest with you, my existing system spends most of its time uh, waiting for I/O. Um, the the goal is. Uh, for these systems is improving throughput um, rather uh, rather than particularly working about worrying about latency. Uh, particularly for instant messaging product, we have a lot of strict ordering guarantees that um, 
that everyone must see everything happen in the same order in a room. Um, so we're much more concerned about uh, being able to go off and do work on a different room while we're waiting for something to happen, to finish happening in a particular chat room. Are any complications with writing unit tests for methods that use coroutines? Yes. Um, essentially, the, um, well, yes and no. Uh, you need to somehow drive your coroutine, um, which means understanding what its engagement pattern is. Um, every coroutine has an implied uh, the pattern of um, how to resume it and what the expectation is for it being done. Um, however, if you're writing the coroutine, you know this and um, can, can do it. The one bit that is a little bit tricky, um, I haven't shown here, um, kicking off your initial coroutine. Uh, essentially, um, as I mentioned, anything that co-awaits is a coroutine. Main is not a coroutine. What you generally have is some sort of, uh, instead of co-await, you have a function that does a sync weight, synchronous weight on your task or your coroutine um, that lets you bootstrap into the coroutine. Uh, You'll do, do a trick where it's like you uh, internally co-await for some event that you always supply, um, and that, that lets you bootstrap into it. Um, or you could do certain tricks like um, use uh, a generator, uh, which from outside uh, looks uh, presents an iterator interface and dereferencing the iterator. Um, churns the coroutine one uh, for forward um, for a generator that's at the code yield. Um, this lets you bootstrap into the, uh, the, into the process. But yeah, it's like, it can be a little bit tricky um, writing coroutine tests, but not particularly not much more complicated than testing any other uh, complex mechanism. Um, certainly you can provide mock interfaces for your, uh, for your co-awaitables to be able to, to uh, uh, control what the various patterns in engagement are. Okay. Uh, we're just at 1030 now. So uh, thank you all again uh, for uh, your kind attention. Uh, and I hope this was all useful for you. And I'll be around uh, later in Gather Town. Um, I still have a lot of maze to explore down there. Bye-bye.